It is my honor to have a chance to speak to you today. This is a very exciting time for those of us who work in aerospace. And I believe that one of the reasons for that excitement is all of the passion, the innovation, and the out-of-the-box thinking that private industry is bringing to space activities. In fact, some people are talking about the progress that we've seen in the last few years and calling this the commercial space age. So today I'd like to talk a little bit about how we got to this point, what kinds of commercial space activities we're seeing today, and what we may see in the future. One of the most important milestones for the development of commercial space was the Ansari X Prize. The X Prize was a $10 million prize that was offered to the first non-governmental group that could design, build, and demonstrate the ability to take three people up to an altitude of 100 kilometers, return safely to the Earth, and then do that same mission again with the same vehicle within two weeks to show that perhaps this could be part of a business instead of just a one-time demonstration. And after the prize was announced, there was so much interest from the entire world. There were 26 different teams from seven different countries that competed for the prize. In the end, though, it was the team from Scaled Composites, led by famed aircraft designer Bert Rattan, that came up with this very unusual system with a carrier aircraft called the White Knight and a spacecraft called Spaceship One. The entire system took off from a runway in Mojave, California, climbed up to 30 to 40,000 feet. Then the spacecraft was released, the pilot turned on the rocket engine, and it zoomed up to the edge of space and then glided back for a runway landing. And they did this twice within two weeks, back in October of 2004, and so they won the prize. After that was over, Spaceship One was donated to the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. And where did they put it? Right between the spirit of St. Louis the plane that Charles Lindbergh used when he first flew the Atlantic, and the Bell X-1, the aircraft that Chuck Yeager flew when he became the first person to break the sound barrier. So why did they put it in this special place of honor? Because this was a major accomplishment. For the first time today, we no longer need a government with thousands of people and billions of dollars to build a spaceship. That got a lot of people's attention. And a lot of people started thinking about what they could do, how they could participate. Another very important milestone for commercial space was the retirement of the space shuttle. And this was important because that meant NASA had committed that from that point forward, it would have to rely on private industry to provide food, clothes, scientific equipment, and other supplies to our astronauts on board the International Space Station. And so they agreed on contracts for commercial cargo with SpaceX using their Falcon 9 rocket and their Dragon capsule, and also with Orbital Sciences Corporation which is now part of Northrop Grumman, using their Antares rocket and their Cygnus spacecraft. And there have been similar agreements for crew transportation with SpaceX and with Boeing. It's important to remember, though, that we're not talking about a competition between government and industry. It's not one or the other. There can be collaboration with mutual benefits by working together. 
We see that even in terms of the facilities that are available. At the Kennedy Space Center, once the space shuttle had been retired, there were many buildings and facilities that NASA no longer needed. So they had been shared. So this is a picture of a building that used to be used to process space shuttle orbiters between missions. It has been turned over to Boeing now for processing their spacecraft for commercial crew and cargo. Similarly, Launch Complex 39A, which is where many of the Apollo moon missions took place, as well as many space shuttle flights, that has now been provided for the use by SpaceX under a 20-year rental agreement. And Blue Origin has built a very large and modern manufacturing facility to build their next generation space vehicles right outside the gate of the Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral. A very good example of how industry can bring increased performance and new ways of thinking is the SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket. It had its first launch, our demonstration mission, back in February of 2018, and I was fortunate enough to be there to watch the launch. This is a large rocket. It is actually 230 feet tall, so that means it is almost 50 feet taller than the space shuttle stack. It weighs 3.1 million pounds. It has 27 rocket engines on the first stage that generate 5.1 million pounds of thrust. And that means it can take payloads weighing up to 140,000 pounds to low Earth orbit. That makes it the most powerful rocket in the world that is in operation today. Now that may change after the first launch of the space launch system, but for today, that is the case. In fact, it is more powerful by a factor of two than any other rocket. And when it leaves the launch pad, you can see it, you can hear it, and you can feel it with the rumble and the crackle of the engines. It's quite an emotional experience. And after several minutes of ascent, then you can turn slightly and observe two rocket boosters coming back in perfect formation for a gentle vertical landing, followed by boom, 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 four rapid fire sonic booms, two from each of the boosters. It's like something out of science fiction. But the show is not over yet because after the second stage had reached orbit and the payload fairings were broken away. Inside was not some lead ballast for a typical first demonstration launch. It was Elon Musk's cherry red Tesla Roadster with a mannequin in a spacesuit behind the driver's seat. A beautiful picture of the Earth in the distance. And on the radio, you could hear music from Starman. It was incredible to see this, and it generated so much attention in the public, in the media, in the whole in the international community. That is very unusual, especially for a launch that did not have any people on board. But in addition to the technology and the hardware, commercial space is changing money, too. If you talk to the analysts who are looking at the money that is being spent and invested in the global space economy, in the whole world. In the last few years, that number has totaled, totaled over $300 billion. But even more interesting, the part in the upper left in the brown, that is the spending by governments and government space agencies. All the rest is from consumers and companies. So commercial space is making a difference in space finances. And even more interesting, if you talk to financial experts and they look at what is coming in the future, their predictions, 
by UBS, a Swiss financial services firm. Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, they're all projecting that the global space economy in just the next 10 or 20 years will exceed one trillion or maybe even two trillion dollars. So there's tremendous growth and interest in commercial space. But this is not just one rocket. It's not just one company. Did you know that in the United States alone, there are six private companies that are building spacecraft to take people to space? Let's quickly look at them. Virgin Galactic has Spaceship Two for its suborbital flights. Also, Blue Origin has its New Shepard rocket for suborbital flights. SpaceX has its Falcon 9 and Dragon 2 to go all the way to orbit. Boeing is building a spacecraft called the Starliner. It's had two unmanned test flights already, and NASA is hoping that Boeing will be able to launch its NASA astronauts to the space station for the first time, maybe next February. A company called Sierra Space is building a mini shuttle called Dream Chaser. They hope to have its first flight in the next year or two. And Lockheed Martin is building the Orion spacecraft for deep space exploration missions. So a lot of different companies are building spaceships. And how about the launchers? We've mentioned the Space Launch System. That's sitting on the launch pad at Cape, Can at Cape Kennedy, the Kennedy Space Center right now as they work out the last minute challenges to get ready for its first launch. That's a government system. But there are many other people who are also developing large rockets. SpaceX is building their Starship, and they are preparing for its first flight. It is taller than the Space Launch System. It is taller than the Saturn V. It will develop twice as much thrust as the Saturn V, and it will be able to take 100 metric tons to orbit. And with refueling, it can take 100 metric tons to the surface of the moon, to the surface of Mars, or to any other location in the solar system. And what's more, it is completely reusable. After its flights, it comes back to be refurbished and launched again. Amazing developments here. Even more interesting, that same vehicle that can be used to take people to the moon and to Mars, we believe it will be able to take people or cargo from one point on the Earth to the opposite side of the Earth in just an hour or so. So that has potential to change everything about how we travel, communicate, do business. It will be interesting to see if this can take place in the near future. Other companies like Blue Origin are also building rockets. We saw their very nice new factory outside the Kennedy Space Center. That's where they're building the new Glenn rocket. That's a very large rocket as well, completely reusable. United Launch Alliance is building a new rocket called the Vulcan. They hope to detach the engines after launch, recover those and refurbish those to again incorporate some degree of reusability to lower the cost for access to space. And there are a number of different companies that are building small launchers for the small satellites that schools and others are building today. Companies like Rocket Lab, Firefly, and Relativity Space, and Virgin Orbit, which again uses a carrier aircraft to launch a small rocket with a small satellite all the way into orbit. We would like to be able to have a place to live and work in space, and for the last 20 years, that has been the International Space Station, but it will not last forever. The goal, the hope, is that it would last till 2030. What happens after that? Well, NASA and the international partners have decided they're not going to build another government space station. Instead, they will rely on commercial space stations. So even today, it has agreements with four different companies to build commercial space, space stations. Maybe more than one. They include Axiom. This is what their station will look like. Northrop Grumman. NanoRacks. 
and a partnership between Sierra Space and Blue Origin. They call their concept Orbital Reef. And their idea is to make it sort of like a business park. You have some areas for scientific research, you have some for commercial space manufacturing, and some that's like a space hotel for space tourists or folks who just would like to get away. And we should see one or more of these concepts before 2030. You've all heard of the Artemis program to return people to the moon, including women, people of color. That's a government program, but commercial space will have an important part in that. SpaceX will be providing their starship to take people down to the surface of the moon from lunar orbit and then back up. And it is a very large vehicle, as we saw before. Once it has been tested out, it has the capability to bring lots of people, lots of equipment, lots of hardware, habitats, experiments. And so we can look forward to that in the near future. It is my hope that this does not turn into just flags and footprints, visit and go home, but that someday we can have a scientific research station or people who stay for long duration on the moon. Jan Werner, who was the previous director general of the European Space Agency, talked about having a moon village. And by that he meant we can have astronauts, we can have robots, we can have rovers, we can have experiments, governments, companies, academia, all working together in partnership and in cooperation. After we learn how to live and work on the moon, we'll be headed to Mars. When will that be? Don't know. Don't know what it'll look like. NASA has a goal of perhaps within 20 years from now. Elon Musk and SpaceX, he says he's confident he can do it within a decade. We'll see whether either of those predictions are correct. And how about after that? Well, it's very difficult to predict the future. Sometimes it's helpful and interesting to look at what science fiction has talked about in books or in movies. Way back in 1968, a movie came out, 2001, A Space Odyssey, which talked about what may happen in space far in the future, in the year 2001. And of course, it painted a picture with very large rotating space stations with artificial gravity in, in low Earth orbit, commercial shuttles taking people from the Earth to the moon and back, and human space flights to the edge of our solar system. Well, here we are 20 years after that was supposed to happen, and it's not quite ready. But as I look at all of the exciting things happening today, the progress that is being made, I am very confident that if we can learn how to work together between government, industry, academia, and the whole international community, we can see this age of commercial space accomplishing some amazing things. I thank you for your attention. Hargeli Handi said this. Tarpanutan Hamar, who promised Ganavar.